Uh, good evening. I'm Annabelle Seldorf, President of the Board of Directors of the Architectural League, and on behalf of the League, I am extremely happy to welcome you here tonight for this co-sponsored program. I'd very much like to thank the Society for Ethical Culture for making their space available to us. Thank you. This opportunity for broad discussion of the expansion plan of the Museum of Modern Art has long been awaited, and I know that it will be a fascinating, civil, and dignified, and stimulating conversation. Um, I mean that I urge you to um, please sort of follow the protocol and let the speakers do their thing, and um, at the end, or intermittently, we'll be collecting cards with questions that you may have. Um, with that, thank you very much for being here. Good night. Hi, I'm the second of three welcomers. Um, thanks, Annabelle. I'm Vince Polo, the board president of the Municipal Arts Society. On behalf of the many MAS board members here tonight and the MAS team, we're so honored and pleased to join the AIA and the League in presenting this evening's discussion. And I'd also like to thank Rick Bell and Rosalie Gennaro for their hard work in pulling this together. Tremendous, you guys. And also thank Rhonda Wist from MAS for her efforts. Of course, cultural institutions are essential for the well-being of our city. They symbolize the best of New York, our creativity and dynamism. Museums and other cultural organizations play a critical role in our city's economy, its appeal, and its very livability as well as in the neighborhoods and streets on which they reside. For over a century, MAS has been focusing on the effect that architecture, design, urban planning, and preservation can have on the quality of our streetscapes and our neighborhoods. So in that tradition, we are pleased to be joining the other presenters tonight in welcoming this important discussion on MoMA. We look forward to an engaging evening, and now I'll turn it over to Lance. Good evening, my name is Lance Brown. I'm the 2014 president of the American Institute of Architects. On behalf of the AIA New York chapter, I'd like to thank Annabelle Seldorf and Vin Cipolla for the extraordinary collaborative effort that brings us all here for this public conversation. And we equally wish to commend both the Museum of Modern Art and Della Scafidio and Renfro for being here to speak about the MoMA's campus plan. As architects and designers, we at the AIA we're interested in co-sponsoring this forum because we continually grapple with issues of complex balancing. Balancing preservation and change, the morphology of the city, balancing public interests and owners' needs, balancing the competing urban scales of building, street, and city. Tonight, we hope to hear about the larger view, including what's going to happen with the broader context, other places will learn lessons from what we see and say here this evening. Thank you all for braving the cold to be here. Thank you panelists for your critical and important contributions. And thanks especially to Reed Kroloff, our moderator and MC, for tonight's civil and civic discussion, nicely nested with my own 2014 president's theme, civic spirit, civic vision. Reed. Hello, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this event has been organized to create an opportunity for thoughtful, respectful conversation. Yes, you heard right. I know a lot of your parents. <laughs> thoughtful, respectful conversation about both the immediate issues at hand, the expansion of the Museum of Modern Art and the fate of the former American Folk Art Museum building, and also some of the larger issues that those two activities portend. On behalf of all of us, I want to thank, and that means all of us here tonight, I want to thank the Architectural League, the Municipal Art Society, and the American Institute of Architects, New York chapter, for making this evening possible. And in very short order, this was a lot of work by a number of people in a tight time frame, so we really do appreciate everything that they've been able to do for us. I also want to thank the Museum of Modern Art and Elizabeth Diller of Diller Scafidio Renfro Architects um, for participating. 
Tonight's proceedings are being filmed. You can see that guy right there and uh, others. There's another guy over there. They're good looking and they have cameras. Um, and will be available shortly after this program when you're not watching the State of the Union. You can re-watch this um, on any of the sponsoring institution's websites. The format tonight will comprise three distinct but interrelated activities. First, we will hear briefly from representatives of the Museum of Modern Art, followed by Liz Diller, with a condensed version of the MoMA expansion plans that were released earlier this month. That will be followed by a panel discussion among five experts gathered by tonight's sponsors. Finally, Ms. Diller and Mr. Glenn Lowry of the Museum of Modern Art will join the panel and me as we consider a series of questions that are submitted by you, the audience, during the architectural presentation and the panel discussion. So while the folks are up here thinking, uh, d uh, talking about MoMA, the expansion plan, and are on the panel discussing that afterwards, we're hoping that you will be formulating... I guess I'm done. <laughs> I must have run over. We're hoping that you will be formulating questions that we will gather from you. There will be a series of ushers in the aisles to gather, there we go, to gather, nah, to gather up uh, your questions from you and bring them up to the front. Those questions, we want you to write them uh, after listening to some of the activities tonight. We want you to put your name on the cards which we will read as we ask the questions, because we really want full transparency here. The questions are not being done in advance. They're gonna be collected now and used this evening. So please write neatly, because I'm gonna have to read them, um, and please do sign them and I will call your name out. As we all know, MoMA's expansion proposal has engendered significant controversy. That's why we're here tonight. And I'd be surprised if emotions weren't running reasonably high. Uh, among the uh, members of the audience. And as the moderator, it'll be my job to keep our conversation relevant, impersonal, civil, and focused. I am not gonna hesitate to interrupt a speaker if they're taking too much time, if they go off into the weeds with what they're talking about, or if for some reason I think it's straying too close to an attack. I certainly have no intention, however, of leeching the energy or the sound out of this evening's conversation. But I want to remind everybody that it is a conversation that we're here to enjoy tonight, not kickboxing. We're here to teach and I hope learn together. And so enough for me for the moment and on to our presentation. I'd like to ask you to help me welcome Glenn Lowry, director, ha Glenn, just in time. <laughs> this is how you know the difference between moderator and director. He lives in a house by Caesar Pelli. I live in a house that Caesar Pelli learned to go to school in, but that's a different thing. Um, so please help me welcome Glenn Lowry. Thank you so much, Reed, and I want to add my thanks as well to the organizers of tonight, the Municipal Art Society, the Architectural League, and the AIA, and to all of you who ventured out uh, in the coal. I was worried nobody was going to come. We welcome the opportunity. We really welcome the opportunity to share the thinking behind our project and the decision concerning the American Folk Art Museum. And I hope, as Reed underscored, that this evening can also address, along the way, some larger questions about what it means to build a museum, and in this case, an expansion in the 21st century, and what we want and expect out of our cultural institutions. I think it can often seem that a place like the Museum of Modern Art is large and monolithic and insensitive to people's concerns, but that's absolutely not the case. We hear your concerns. We understand that many people have lots of questions about what we do all the time. And we are an intensely self-critical organization, constantly querying what we do and why we do it. But what we do is at the core of this discussion and project, and that is to try and make the Museum of Modern Art an immeasurably better place by focusing on our collection, the artists we represent, and our public. This project is about the art. 
It's about providing 30% more gallery space for the museum in order to create the kinds of spaces that we urgently need to tell our story even better than we do today. Now, over the last couple of weeks, it seems to me that three big questions have emerged. The first is how could a museum, especially a museum with a curatorial department of architecture that has argued for modern architecture and design, not preserve another museum? The second is why does a museum of modern art need to expand at all? And the third is whether or not there's a way to incorporate the American Folk Art Museum into our program. Ann Temkin, who's with me on stage, and I will deal with the first questions, and Liz will deal with the issues of the Folk Art Museum and our larger plans. Our decision concerning the American Folk Art Museum was not easy, and it wasn't taken lightly. We spent the last six months investigating any number of options with our architects, trying to find an alternative, looking for other solutions to taking down the building, but we ultimately concluded that it simply wasn't possible to adapt the existing building and also serve our public, artistic, and programmatic needs. Now, the reason we need to expand is relatively simple and straightforward. We want to show more of our extraordinary collection in new and compelling ways. And the 40,000 square feet that this project will provide in new gallery space allows us to do this and allows us to engage our public in new and different ways. Now, we also recognize that there are a number of issues with our existing building, from the austerity and compressed space of our lobby to the circulation around the museum and in the galleries that require attention and need to be addressed. And this project also looks at how to make the existing campus of the museum even better than it is. But since this project is driven by a new generation of chief curators who have new and important things to say about our collection and the art they're responsible for, I thought it would be helpful to hear from Ann Temkin, who is the chief curator of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art, and one of the museum's seven chief curators. Ann? Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Glenn. Thank you, everyone. I'm here speaking on behalf of the curatorial staff. And simply want to say that among ourselves, we feel our greatest responsibility, very simply, is to share with the public the collection of the greatest museum of modern and contemporary art in the world. And since our founding, that mission has always had two prongs. It's to show the art of the past, initially the very recent past, and the art of the present day, the present moment. That's a double job that obviously gets bigger and bigger as time goes by. We are committed to showing the canonical icons that make every um, Art History 101 textbook and that are beloved treasures to visitors from all over the world. But at the same time, we and Glenn mentioned it is entirely a new generation of curators, have more than a linear narrative in mind as we work. We don't see the history of modern art as one history, we see it as multiple histories, and that there are a network of moments and places about which we have to tell the story, not just one. For example, there's Latin America, Brazil in the 1950s. And by the way, all the works that I'm showing now are works in the collection um, that have been built up recently and since 50, 80 years ago. Japan in the 1950s and 60s, um, work that was featured in our show on Tokyo last year. LA, African-American artists there in the 70s doing maverick work, largely unknown, um, in New York until the show at MoMA PS1 last year, Now Dig This. Feminist art of the 1970s, deeply collected by us, maybe 30 years later, 
but now a very strong part of the collection. All of these are pockets of art history that need to be shown, not instead of, but beside the pictures that come to mind most immediately when people connect with MoMA. In addition to broadening our territory, we also have to dive deeper into it in terms of what we show. You may remember the Abex New York show of 2010. In that, you had the satisfaction of looking at a room of a dozen Rothkos, a room of 18 Pollocks, a wall of Gorkies. We can do that kind of depth with scores of artists, photographers, filmmakers, architects. Here's just one example, Lee Bontaku. We have work spanning 40 years. Also different kinds of depth, not just of single monographic artists, but isms or movements such as fluxus, a gift from the Silvermans a few years ago, have given us the most comprehensive fluxus collection in the world. Here's something which is shown intermittently, not always. Similarly, the gift from the Frank Lloyd Wright archive last year, which is in the show opening this coming week, scores of material that should be accessible. Besides breadth, there's of course depth, and there's also finally scale. We all know the Monet water lilies were the first thing in the early 60s to occupy a room as a single work of art. That was a brand new notion at that time. In the 60 years since, there have been um, countless works that take up a room. Parallel, of course, to the water lilies, you have the swimming pool of Matisse, which hasn't been on view since the Taniguchi building opened. We'll debut this fall in our Matisse cutouts show. Rosenquist's F111, a work that's again on view now and then, yet it's a core landmark of pop art, room-sized. Jennifer Bartlett's Rhapsody, here you see it in the atrium, another big room-sized work. Kara Walker's first wall drawing, gone, now these are all um, in the collection. And finally, Mike Kelly's deodorized central mass with satellites came into the collection last year now on view at MoMA PS1 for one more week or a few more days. So essentially, with all of these responsibilities, breadth, depth, the ever-increasing scale, we have a responsibility that only space is the answer to. And what I want to finally say is that MoMA is not merely a museum in New York, it's a catalyst. And I think this is maybe the point that's nearest to the curators' hearts. We became a center of art production, a great international center akin to Florence in the Renaissance, because in part of the collections that MoMA produced for artists to see. Artists were astonished inspired, challenged, and provoked to make art that equaled or outdid what they've seen on our walls. And as curators, it's our responsibility, we feel, to the art of tomorrow and to this city to make the breadth and depth of these holdings as accessible as they can be. Thank you. So Reed has the enviable task of keeping us all on time, and I noticed him flipping the two-minute warning. Uh, so I'm going to be as precise and quick as I possibly can be, but I do want to tee up uh, Liz's presentation. We knew, obviously, when we began this project that it was going to be complicated and that it was going to raise many questions. But we also believe that the improvements to our existing campus and the substantial increase in space merits the effort. We chose Diller, Scafidi, and Renfro after interviewing several architectural firms because of their understanding of the museum's strengths and its weaknesses. 
because they've been engaged in a thoughtful and compelling institutional critique of museums and specifically of the Museum of Modern Art over many years and because of their proven ability to give new life to existing buildings as well as their deep understanding of the needs of museums in the 21st century. Their mandate was to look at our entire campus, including the space of the Nouvelle Tower, the Folk Art Museum, and the Taniguchi and Goodwin and Stone and Johnson buildings. They asked for the opportunity to revisit our decision to take down the Folk Art Museum and to query our assumptions about what else needed to be done, and we readily agreed. A generation ago, before we built our last expansion, the museum looked at moving off of 53rd Street, as well as dividing ourselves into multiple sites. And ultimately, we decided we were a midtown museum, committed to being in the heart of the city, where New Yorkers can see and enjoy one of the most incredible collections of modern and contemporary art in the world. That decision had a number of consequences, including the current issues we're here to discuss tonight. But it also resulted in a vibrant institution that has been and will continue to be of huge benefit to New York City, its many visitors, and those who are lucky enough to live here. Thank you. Okay, I think I'd like to keep a little art up. Um, I have to say that uh, the most praise that uh, I've received in the last three weeks has been uh, for my bravery in coming here tonight uh, to talk to this group. Um, I, wanna, I wanna thank the, the hosting organizations for collaborating to do this. It's important to have um, an opportunity to, when, when something is fresh, as this to, um, to be discussed publicly. Um, we at, at DSNR um, find ourselves inside of the clamor uh, of a debate about many things, including MoMA's previous expansions, um, about the loss of intimacy and irreversible tide of mass tourism, uh, about the homogenization of Midtown, about whether glass is good or bad, and many other things. There's a, there are a lot of debates going on, and this has been a kind of trigger. Um, and, and a lot of these paint um, the participants into, um, into victims or villains or martyrs or scapegoats. And um, while everyone in this room um, must maintain a vigilance about the fate of our cities, and our modernist buildings um, that have such f few advocates, except architects, um, we, we also have to look at the circumstances of each situation. It's hard to make blanket, um, uh, uh, a kind of doctrinaire opinion about everything, you know, every, every situation is unique, and this one is very, very exceptional and it involves a 13-year-old building. It doesn't quite fit into a historic building, and it's by living and much-respected uh, colleagues, Todd, Bill, uh, Todd uh, Williams and Billy Chen. And it's unfathomable to many people where, why we are in this situation. Um, we welcome this opportunity to, to speak before this group of peers um, to explain in an unfiltered way the very um, specific issues that we've been grappling with. And even if we don't change a single mind in the room, um, we hope that there's a greater appreciation of the challenge and the work that went into the last six months. Um, first, I, I, I want to just clarify the timeline again. Um, Glenn mentioned it. MoMA invited us into the discussion about the expansion several weeks after their announcement of the Folk Art Museum demolition. And uh, the project was to involve the two sites, the Heinz site, the Folk Arts Museum, and a broader look at MoMA, um, especially the ground floor. And at our interview, we stated very clearly that we were unconvinced by the decision to demolish the building, and um, we would not accept the project, the commission, uh, unless we could explore the viability of saving the building in full or in part. 
And, um, and we asked them for a good amount of time to do that as we learned the building, as we learned the curators and the mission and, and the buildings, all the buildings. Um, MoMA agreed um, as long as we could find a productive use for the Folk Art Museum. Um, and it had to be one that served the museum's mission and new curatorial goals. Um, there were really two reasons why we wanted to do the project in the face of this difficult um, decision and, uh, and, and kind of stepping in there. One was we truly believed that we could save this building and we believed that we could, sa that we could breathe new life into it. Um, and the second was that MoMA's mission forward was very compelling to us. Um, we're both supporters and critics of MoMA and uh, we have some of the very same concerns that have been voiced uh, in, in, the, uh, in the media. Um, it's our museum too, and we want it to be as good as it can be. Um, we found MoMA uh, along the, uh, the last six months to be truly introspective and autocritical, um, and that was really good. They were bashing themselves all the time. Um, and their objectives were driven by this new uh, crop of chief, chief curators, um, the post uh expansion curators that, that really wanted to rethink the collections across media and across disciplines and reflect on MoMA's role in, in, construct, in constructing modernist history um, that Anne talked about. And the conversations are incredible. We're learning so much from these guys. And um, there's a lot of new thinking being created. Um, but despite the six months efforts by Rick Charles and I and a very hardworking team of architects in our studio um, to find a way of meeting both, of, both MoMA's uh, needs um, for the future and uh, while preserving the integrity of the Folk Art Museum, uh, we were unable to find an adaptive reuse solution. And, um, and this you know, brings us a lot of pain and grief um, but it, it is um, the second time this announcement is being made now. Um, we know the architectural community has been counting on us, so while the outcome of, is the same as it was um, in April 2003 when this was announced, um, we're confident that the conclusion is based on a very thorough study that such an important decision deser deserves. Um, I'd like to take you through just a fraction of the work um, that, uh, that was done in the past six months, and also um, with a focus on, on, uh, on this particular um, issue, which um, is uh, very emotional, but at the same time looking more broadly at, at MoMA's goals. Um, so um, there are really two MoMAs. There's the good MoMA, uh, which we see here, and then there's the bad MoMA. And we think that there's a lot to be fixed here. Um, there's, there's a lot of good, um, but one needs to take a deep dive into uh, the institution. It's not just limited to um, the new territory. And um, it, it really, uh, one of the most compelling things, you know, in, aside from fixing problems, is this ambition to to show, uh, to, to expand um, the public uh, accessibility to 30% uh, more of their collections and of their um, and temporary exhibitions. So this is really a large, um, in a sense, it's a very large uh, expansion opportunity, but it's not, in the end, a lot of space. Um, so just to explain a little bit um, the goals um, to make the collection public, we've said that. Uh, just a percentage of the, of, the sh of the collection is on view. Create flexible multi-disciplinary uh, galleries. So allow the museum to break from the limitations of its current media-specific galleries and bring together work across disciplines. Improve the museum experience, especially circulation. Um, areas of the museum are clogged. They're very difficult to navigate. It is kind of uh, clinical. Um, provide a strong interface with the city. The one place that looks like an entrance, the Durrell Stone canopy, has a sign that says no entrance. Um, and despite the fact that uh, the public flocks to its doors, 
MoMA feels a bit aloof um, and sometimes a little over sanitized. Um, bring art closer to the street. We felt strongly about this. You have to walk a quarter mile to get to the voice of an artist or a curator. Address the museum as a whole. One can't do any piece in isolation. Um, it's an organism, and every part affects every other part. So we had to look at things comprehensively. And beyond these things, we also wanted to find ways for the museum to also be more spontaneous and um, to figure out a way of creating um, pockets of intimacy that have been lost. Um, the site is a collection of modernisms. There's uh, Stone and Johnson and Pelly, Taniguchi. And um, each of these have distinctive elevations. And behind, there seems to be an interior that's smoothed over. Um, and the question that we asked ourselves at the very beginning of this was, um, is modernism finished? Um, is it an unfinished project? Uh, where do we stand? Um, and how are we to grapple with these two sites? Um, now, looking a little bit more uh, closely at the, um, the, the, the two new sites, um, so the, um, the green is the Jean Nouvel uh, Tower, and this is uh, at level two, um, and um, the, uh, the, the pink is the Folk Art Museum, you all know that, and um, the space, the, the square in the center is, uh, is a courtyard that's partially uh, occupied by the lower levels of Folk Art Museum, but otherwise um, a void. And, um, Looking more specifically at the, at the Heinz site, um, there are three levels, level two, uh, four, and five, which are consistent with the MoMA uh, collections levels. And the ground floor uh, at Heinz is inaccessible uh, to this expansion, so it's all occupied by Heinz program. Uh, and this is really important um, in the uh, circulation. So, it's mindful, you know, I just want to show you one detail. It's important to see this. Um, the neck of this building is uh, 45 feet wide, which is quite restrictive. And, um, and we have protecting, been protecting as much space for flexible exhibitions uh, here as possible. 45 feet is um, just about the size of a gallery, and it's impossible to stack two galleries wide. So this leads to a lot of um, technical issues and problems with circulation. Um, one thing that we knew from the beginning was that we wanted to have a very distinctive language for the, uh, for the new space, for the new galleries. We're not committed to specific language here, but uh, we wanted to cross a threshold and walk into something different. So that this notion, the tendency of smoothing over um, the histories was not to be done. And this was quite important. Um, now, this, these are the public levels of the Folk Art Museum. Um, and the size, you could see the size and the configuration of the floor plates are very challenging here. The programming, um, for a modern and contemporary art uh, museum could not be more incompatible, in a sense, with a building that was conceived for folk art. So, um, as we started to think about what, you know, what we're going to do here and how we're going to um, interpret these sites, um, we knew that we couldn't, that it was impossible to do a preservation. We just knew because of circulation issues. Um, we wanted to, to do a, an adaptive reuse, and we asked ourselves the question, well, um, what are the character-defining features of this building? That is, what makes this building this building? Um, one is the uh, white bronze facade, and um, that um, many people have, uh, have talked about, and something very, very different on the street. Ironically, the facade is no less opaque than the Tanaguchi next door, which appears to be glass. Um, but it's, you know, there, there are many kind of interesting ironies and, uh, and issues that we, that we find in the process. Um, another very uh, important character defining 
characteristic uh, is, the, is the material palette and the detailing. There's clearly an effort to connect the character of the architecture here with the scale of the work that it displays. Um, yet another uh, important uh, characteristic is the vertical organization of the building with its many stairs and voids and the diffuse light filtering to all floors. It's the real body and character of the building. Um, and it's also maybe the biggest part of the challenge um, to figure out how to adapt these, uh, the voids and the stairs and the small and partial fl floor plates into MoMA's programming. Um, and um, of course the, the skylights. The, the opacity of the front facade is balanced really by two dominant skylights, one at the very top of the building and uh, just over the central stair and one at the back, um, at the, the rear court. Um, so, um, as I said, uh, preservation was not possible. Um, the very bespoke nature of, of, this, of, of the design of the folk art um, with its many sculptural stairs and multi-story voids and the partial floor plates would have to, uh, all, just generally, it, one cannot do it without incurring alterations. Um, it was clear um, also f to us from the beginning that, um, that the folk art would never fit into MoMA's gallery requirements. So we had to really take it off the, uh, off the table. Um, and there was, a, you know, there was a bit of back and forth there um, because um, you know, it, it was doomed if it had to do um, galleries on these same levels. It would just be all raised. So we pushed MoMA. Um, uh, and requested to look at alternative programs. And um, they pulled back from their request for more gallery space. And, um, but they required that, that, these, um, that, that, that the new spaces, that the new creation that we would do uh, with the folk art would be productive and uh, a relevant part of their program. And so right from the beginning, we knew that this was gonna be a dance with, with the building, new architecture and existing architecture. Um, our objective was to strike a balance uh, between this new programming, the technical limitations of the site, um, and limiting impacts on the building. Um, so this is, it's important now to just um, look at the MoMA plan. This is the existing plan. The, uh, the red loop you see there is basically the loop that one has to, uh, that one takes. MoMA sets up its, its um, uh, collections galleries as blocks of chronology, and, um, and the public makes its way through the chronology from beginning to end and changes floors and continues. Um, so with this in mind, um, without the Folk Art Museum, this would be the circulation um, from the collection. So the intention is to expand the collection um, this would have to be the circulation without the use of folk art. Um, and you could see because of the, because of the width of, of the space, it's impossible to make a loop. Um, and even if we were able to, we would create more traffic jams in uh, uh, the galleries that were already pretty uh, packed out. So we knew we would have to, um, we would have to somehow bridge over the space to create the loop. And, um, and in addition to creating the loop, um, which could be done at the southern part of the building or slightly to the north, would have to avoid uh, one of MoMA's, a private core of MoMA's. Um, it could be either one of those locations, but in either way, um, it would have to reconcile uh, the misalignment of two of the three floors. It's two uh, and four. Uh, MoMA doesn't have a third floor in these, uh, in these Taniguchi galleries. It's double height space on the second floor. Um, so here you can see th this is the situation. Um, second floor here with a four foot difference and the fourth floor fourth with a five foot difference. Um, the fifth floor is almost nearly aligned. And when you um, align the floors to be able to connect the loop, to be able to use the expansion, 
you basically um, have to remove some other elements that are here, some other floors and connectors here because you um, end up having headroom problems. So, so we had to um, uh, close the loop here and we had to somehow create a bridge. Um, and um, we thought that on the southern side would be actually the, the easiest, the best, and the least invasive side um, to make these bridges. But in order to do so, one would have to actually remove the facade. And um, the facade is being carried by the slabs. One would have to cut back the slabs and create a strong back structure and then reconnect the facade to the structure. And um, so we, when we looked at this, this is the cross section, the north-south section of the building. You could see the affected area. You could see it in plan. And we tried also um, to see if, you know, we didn't love the idea of, uh, of the prosthetic uh, holding the, the facade. We looked at the back very, very closely and the back actually produced, you could see here, the blue hatch is uh, amount of space affected, that it actually took more space. Um, and we didn't really anticipate this so much. A uh, part of the reason is that there, these back floors are supported by um, a, a rear structure that is basically hanging uh, the slabs. So I'm not sure what that is. Um, but nevertheless, we uh, come back to the southern loop, which is really the best way to do this. The other thing that was very important is that we needed a core. Um, we extend the, the museum by a considerable amount, and then um, we really have to service it uh, by infrastructure. So aside from the horizontal circulation, we had to bring vertical circulation in and amenities and all sorts of stuff. This is the least invasive place to have put this core. And you could see the other cores are quite far away. Um, and you need this vertical circulation to not um, jam up the, uh, the, the galleries. Um, and so the public has uh, options. Um, yes. Oh my god, OK. So I'm going to go through this very quickly. The new core can only be in this location. It's the least invasive place. And what happens with the, um, uh, with the core, with this core, is um, necessarily uh, it, it um, has to take away the back part of the building and the skylight. It's just what, what happens. Uh, again, more of the repercussions. Um, in order to be able to service this new expansion, we need mechanical equipment and we need art support that's close to the new galleries. Um, and the only place for that is really the top of the building. And the moment you do that, you really you take away the, uh, the skylight, which is a very important uh, feature that actually is linked to the vertical organization of, of the Folk Art Museum. Um, so we looked at um, all of this with these uh, various impacts and the square footage that was uh, what we felt potentially usable. And uh, we came up with lots of different types of programs that we brought to MoMA, um, uh, education, uh, uh, reading rooms, uh, study center, um, all sorts of things that are, some are here and some are not here. Um, and the, uh, in the end, uh, MoMA, brought a lot of our thinking, our ideas, to the curatorial and education teams. And, um, and it was uh, considered by MoMA that, that, these, uh, that these size spaces were really, really difficult to use. Um, and uh, and the, the, the problems that the circulation would produce by these small spaces would just compound the problem that we are seeing at MoMA already. Um, this is kind of the way it looked. It was kind of very Gordon Matta Clark um, to kind of slice through and embed this this building and um, and actually look into multiple levels. Um, so that was that was the the going thinking. Um, in order to really um, have uh, MoMA start to 
understand and be able to use productively these spaces, we had to start filling floor plates. That was the only way. And that's what you see here. Um, and what that did was it produced some 1,400 square foot floor plates that actually um, were, um, uh, were, were, were pretty interesting. We um, uh, uh, thought of these as micro galleries that junior curators could use, kind of down and dirty spaces that didn't have the long lead times of the museum. And, um, and this was um, uh, really entertained by the museum. The museum thought it was interesting. However, we came to a place um, where, uh, and this was uh, really kind of uh, very tough, where we had lost all the natural light in the building. We had now plugged up the central feature, the central stair. Um, a lot of the distinctive features and the detailing have been lost here. And we came upon this really um, terrible paradox that um, in order to save the building, in order to convince MoMA, and in order for MoMA to really uh, have a productive space, it was inevitable that we would lose more and more of the original building. And uh, I would say it's heart and soul. Um, the fact that this small building resists change is its strength. And um, I have to say, and so this is ultimately the kind of, this is the total impact, and at this point, there's very little left. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, we felt that at, at a certain point, uh, without the light, without the vertical sequence, uh, without the facade now prosthetically uh, held there, which we thought was at a certain point uh, an empty gesture, the building had lost its identity. And who would benefit from this? MoMA would have compromised spaces, um, uh, Williams and Chen would get a tortured patchwork, a kind of monster of a building. Um, and, and we felt that this, 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 this was the strength of the building. It just resisted um, change. It was obdurate. Um, and as strong advocates of adaptive reuse, our studio has successfully reconciled um, pieces of New York's uh, built history with new programming and new audiences. We've succeeded um, at the High Line and parts of Lincoln Center. And unfortunately, despite our best efforts, we were not able to find a solution here. Um, we'd like to, I'd like to just show you very quickly, I know I'm almost out of time, show you a little bit of the uh, plan. And I have to say we're committed to ensuring that the building that succeeds MoMA, the, the Folk Art uh, Museum, is, um, is, it brings a cu cultural relevance to uh, uh, on the street that MoMA uh, doesn't right now have, allows it to do something it doesn't currently do. Okay, so um, the future um, couldn't be thought in isolation, as I said before, it needs to be looked at comprehensively, and um, we add really all the sites to it, and uh, this is, um, uh, besides, uh, you know, space for new programming and uh, Adventures new programming and also traditional exhibitions, we want to dig into the body of the museum and surgically intervene to make the museum better. And uh, I want to talk about some of the specifics of the ground plan. Well, this is what you know, backups everywhere. Um, we would like to make a double height um, entry here. We want to fix some of the problems with coat check and with, uh, with uh, admissions, push the ticket taking locations, way off to near the cores to allow this whole space to be kind of free and open to the public. We're um, uh, putting in this east-west connector to allow uh, the west uh, part of the site to be connected to the main body of the museum, also to bring in the, um, the louder film lobby. And, uh, and all of this will be continuous, contiguous space. We're also um, now looking at the idea of opening up the uh, uh, the garden um, as well uh, to the public and um, uh, kind of inverting the bookstore, part of the bookstore and, and making this all kind of a, a much uh, better place. Um, and when we look at the, so this is just a little bit of a tour. Um, this is the way we imagine it. Um, places for art uh, everywhere. We're turning down the west corridor here and um, going towards the new expansion. 
um, and um, in the lobby of that expansion. Um, I have to underscore that this is not designed. Um, it's been six months. We've been looking at many, many things and learning many things. So these are all very notional. Um, the uh, triple height uh, sliver here goes right to the second floor. His ability to communicate. Uh, one of the problems is really navigation through the museum. This is a work that we're going to be doing on the Bauhaus lobby. Uh, we want to extend the Bauhaus stair to connect five levels um, and uh, to bring light down into the Titus auditoriums here. So this will be uh, a new entrance that will relieve some of the congestion also. So here's the fragment and um, we're looking at this connection that will bring you down and also up to levels two and three and some notional uh, thoughts about uh, the design. Um, from the outside, from 53rd Street, um, we're proposing, so we're right here, we're proposing also um, to look at pushing back, um, there's a lot of black glass here, um, pushing back the museum's art walls 15 feet back to uh, produce a space um, that it has a um, more of an interface with the public, this breakout space, a little bit more intimate and use glass for what it does best, which is transparency here on the second floor. Um, with a prominent entrance, this is just um, tweaking the existing. And um, in this site, we're proposing a space for um, experimental exhibitions right off of the street. Um, this is the uh, location of the art bay, and we've been um, called on this a lot in the press, and we don't, you know, we have, I would say, less specific conviction about the design because it's really not designed, but we do feel strong conviction in putting an experimental space right out there, right on the street. And, um, and the way we're doing that is uh, to bridge right behind, very close to the core, to allow as much space uh, to come uh, to the southern part of the site. Um, and here are the two stacked spaces. Here's the bridge in back. And um, this space is a little bit, um, you know, re return, it has a new name, but it has a bit of uh, a return to the projects room, which was um, in the 70s, it was a very important space in the museum um, where, uh, uh, for artists' installations. So we imagine that this new space um, with the help of the curators, could be a space for installations, could be more spontaneous, could be for events, um, call cultural events, um, and uh, uh, concerts and performances and all sorts of things. Um, now, quickly looking at the back uh, of the museum, this is the 54th Street face. Um, we are proposing here um, to take the, uh, uh, the gate that's already there and to open it up uh, just a little bit more. It's not a big intervention, but make it transparent and make it more welcoming. The gate is flippable um, and it makes uh, another entrance into, uh, the, uh, into the garden. And this is, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of concern whether this would be overrun and over jammed. And uh, we feel that this is like a valve. It could be open and closed and the museum can experiment, which it has been doing during the summer and it's been quite successful and not overrun. Um, so to, um, I, I, the, the, the project is very much in progress. Um, I don't wanna leave with an image because it's really not a thing yet. It's a process. Um, it's very difficult to look at an institution that's so, that's got such a rich history um, and to look at it analytically. It, it takes time to really understand it. Um, this will not be a sweeping expansion like that of Pelli or Taniguchi. Um, it's restrained and it's surgical, um, yet the expansion represents a significant shift in the priorities of the institution to be more democratic and more welcoming and more integrated. And we'll continue uh, to work with MoMA's curators to envision um, this new comprehensive and integrated exhibition strategy and the way it tra traverses the entire museum, not just the western part. Um, we'll also work on strategies to improve circulation and visitor distribution and the access to art and the diversity and quality of the visitor experience. Um, we want to be able to make it better. Um, maybe making it better might involve the fourth axis time. You know, could the Museum of the Future be 24-7? 
Um, we'll continue to explore the strategies um, to uh, bring uh, art um, to the ground, to the street level, in dynamic and unexpected ways. And we'll try to retrieve some of the archaeology of the various layers of history on the site, including um, the Folk Art Museum. And we'll try to design um, for a kind of presentness of MoMA. Um, it's the key to the singular institution. MoMA needs to be perpetually contemporary, and it needs to continually reflect on its past. And we see um, this forum and the kind of feedback we're getting from everyone, positive or negative, um, as opportunities um, for um, taking a constructive way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, very much. Uh, I know that this is a room full of architects, and um, it would be difficult to make a presentation of a small addition to your house in 35 minutes. Um, to, make an to talk about an addition to a museum of this scale and of this complexity and this um, amount of controversy in that amount of time is all but impossible. Um, I made the decision to give our friend Liz an extra five minutes. It hardly seems a big sacrifice, um, but she had a lot to explain, so thank you. That was, that was a, a great job and very complicated. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going to see Liz again, and we're going to see Glenn Lowry again uh, in, a few, uh, in a little while, but now we're going to move to our panel. Um, I'm going to ask my first question from here, and then I'm going to take my seat uh, next to Jorge, um, and I'm going to throw this one out to you. Really, why does the public have any right to talk about what the Museum of Modern Art plans to do with its buildings? They own them, and they plan their, they control their future. What constitutes the public interest in this expansion plan by MoMA? Uh, well, I think we have a right to talk about... Let's make sure your mic is on. Is it on? Are these on? Oh, okay. Is that all right? I think... Um, uh, well, the right to talk about the project is, I guess, the freedom of speech. Um, uh, that would be the strict definition of it. But I think that the more, the more interesting question here that, that's being asked is that um, the, the museum is a cultural institution. This is, um, it's part of the city. Cities are shared, shared objects. And um, we have, we all, all of us that live in cities have commitments that go beyond ourselves. So we, we enter into the public sphere when we, when we live in a city. Uh, and we enter in it not only through discourse, uh, as, as we would through speech, but also through space. So the streets are public and, and, and they're shared spaces. And buildings enter into that, uh, into that public space as, uh, as, as publics public expressions of, of architecture. And I think that as shared objects, what cities are, um, are they're, they're defined by their qualities, not so much by their quantities. I think a lot of the discussion that we've been having has had to do with, with quantities and square footages and so on. Um, there are a lot of cities that are the same size as New York, that have the same population as New York, that are near the water. But New York is different because of its because of its qualities. So I think that the public has a right to talk about quality, um, has has a right to raise the conversation um, about the nature of, of a city, about the nature of architecture, and to talk about the what constitutes architectural quality. I think we start at a little bit of a disadvantage, uh, maybe not in this room, but outside in the public sphere, because most people take an art appreciation class, so everybody sort of has, you know, in, in your basic uh, sort of core curriculum, but very few people take an architecture appreciation class. So very few people understand architectural quality or, or have uh, the language to, to discuss it. So it's very important for us to, to step forward and, and talk about it. Um, and, and it's part of our, um, part, not only our right, but our responsibility is to defend the qualities that, uh, that make up uh, both the city and the buildings in it uh, and its cultural institutions like, like MoMA. 
So Kathleen, let me follow up with you. What do you think constitutes the public interest in this particular expansion? If, if the public has the right, if Jorge is correct, if the public has the right to respond and an and active role in this, what do you think their interest is in this? What is good for the public here? Well, obviously there's a lot of different ideas about what is good for the public, but I do think that MoMA, even if it is a private institution, depends on the public. We feel very much part of it. Uh, most of us in this room engage it with a great pleasure and interest. Uh, and it is right in the middle of our city. I mean, Glenn talked about how it was an important decision to stay in Midtown, to stay on 53rd Street. I think we think it's a real amenity in Midtown. And, you know, it's part of the street and part of our uh, lives here. Uh, so I think it's terribly important. And by the same token, the Folk Art Museum was part of our lives here, and uh, not just its facade, but its presence on the street. Um, and, and I think that's why a lot of us feel uh, quite strongly about it. Um, when the Folk Art Museum opened in 2001, it was, as all of you remember, kind of an incredible moment. It was three months after 9-11, and I think we felt extraordinarily strongly about our city. We didn't know where we would all be uh, 10, 12 years hence, but it was a kind of incredible coming together. It was also the first uh, museum built from the ground up in New York City since the Whitney opened in the 60s. It won many, many awards. Uh, we all know it's quirky. We all know it has certain issues. It was built very much uh, inspired by the townhouses that once lined that block. Uh, that has to do with the challenges of bringing light in, as Liz described. It has to do with it, it being kind of a museum about stairs. Townhouses are about stairs. Um, but it's got an incredibly important place, I think, in our cultural history. Alas, it hasn't had it for very long, and I think that's why a lot of us are very concerned about um, the speed with which these, this, kind of, this decision has moved ahead. All right, um, Stephen, um, I would like to uh, take a second question to you, a little bit different, um, but I'm kind of curious if you think the decision to demolish the Folk Art Museum represents a failure of architecture on the part of the original building, or is it more a failure of vision on the part of MoMA in reimagining the program of that structure? That's an easy question. <laughs> there's nobody, I mean, there's no politics in that is, at all. Well, it's easy because I think the answer is no and no. It would be churlish to take the Folk Art Museum to task for not having anticipated its own institutional collapse and the fact that MoMA would be anticipating how to reuse its spaces uh, when it was being designed 15, 16 years ago. And I think to the second question, whether MoMA has uh, an obligation to imagine the reuse of the building, um, it's a much more interesting question, but I don't think it works to talk about it in terms of failure. I think that what Liz and her colleagues have just presented to us is an extraordinary concept which responds to a feasibility study or a series of questions from MoMA. I think Liz was very articulate about the way in which those questions have been posed. Um, what I think is interesting is that feasibility studies, as all the architects here know, um, are only as good as the questions that are asked. So that if the question that, that is asked is find the best, most flexible, optimum use of a particular site and tell us what that's going to be, in this particular instance, I think it's inevitable that the answer to that question is the Folk Art Museum has to be taken down. And I think Liz made that extremely clear for all of the planning reasons and the diagrams that she showed. If, on the other hand, the question is, we as an institution have decided that there is something of value in the existing pieces of this structure, 
and we want to make that a condition of its reuse, find a way to do the best for MoMA while integrating and preserving some piece of this history, then I think that any number of architects, and certainly Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro, could come back with a quite compelling project, which would be a very different one from the one we've seen now. Um, and I'm, I, I, I want to be clear, I'm not trying to make a polemic that attacks uh, the work that's been presented. Um, some of you know that I spent seven years working on the previous expansion, and so I appreciate perhaps better than many in the audience just how subtle some of the suggested moves are and just how thoroughly they address some of the problems that were already clear back in 2000 when the Taniguchi expansion <clears throat> was being planned. Um, I'd like to illustrate the point, if I may, just very quickly by referring to MoMA's other building on 53rd Street. The 11 West building, the iconic 1939 building, has in the 75 years of its existence been reworked radically on six separate occasions. That works out to just about once every 12 and a half years. Its rear facade has been rebuilt three times. Its front facade has been taken down and then entirely restored by KPF after the last expansion, or during the last expansion. It has had both of its sides blown out to connect to the Philip Johnson expansions. Uh, it now has uh, a very upscale bar where Edward Durrell Stone originally put uh, the Picassos and the Matisses, which might have pleased Stone a great deal. But <laughs> the reason that this building is still there in the way in which we see it is because every time over those 75 years that MoMA asked for a feasibility study, the precondition was that something of the 11 West 53rd Street building, the original Goodwin Stone building, be incorporated into the new solution. And certainly, there was no adequacy of that building to all of the new tasks that were asked of it. In fact, the floors didn't align on several occasions. Again, I'm not suggesting that MoMA needs or even has a public obligation to treat the Folk Art Museum or its facade in the same way that it's, treat it's treated its own building, uh, obviously its iconic home for 75 years. What I am suggesting is that there's a discussion that can be had that changes dramatically depending on how the original question is posed. Okay, let me ask Nikolai to follow up on that. <clears throat> well, I guess I'd, I, I, in this whole discussion, I'd like to step back for a second because I think what we're talking about is cultural priorities in a way, right? And how to balance them. On the one hand, we have a, a building that's part of um, the cultural history, the collective memory of the city. Um, on the other hand, we have MoMA's responsibility towards its own collection, right? Which I think we all think of, all, even though MoMA is a private institution, as something that belongs to us as well. And I think what's, uh, having said that, I think it has to be said that we're not talking about uh, a Mies building or a um, uh, building by Louis Kahn, right? In which case, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, it's, it's clear, at least to me, that when we talk about uh, the Folk Art Museum, we're talking about a building that in many ways is flawed. It's an important part of our architectural memory, which means a lot to me. But I think I would place it somewhere in the lineage of um, two Columbus Circle, similar problems, um, the new museum in a way that also a kind of a townhouse model that's very tight, that has major circulation problems, right? Um, and it is a difficult place to show art. So having said that, then I think you get into very tricky architectural territory. Um, how do you retrofit this building so that it somehow can be integrated into the needs of the collection, um, the needs of MoMA, and at the same time respect its history. And then you get into this very kind of slippery question, which is, okay, if you need to take down parts of the building, which I believe you do, at what point do you say the building is so compromised that it's no longer a building? Um, I've always felt very strongly that, uh, uh, against the idea of facadism, right? The idea that the facade itself could stand and the rest of the building, and I, I believe Todd and Billy, Billy have taken a stand against that. 
So you, now you start to look at, uh, maybe in this case the facade is important in terms of uh, the, the uh, architectural articulation of the street, um, of our di articulating different points in history and things like that and allowing them to stand side by side. Um, but I think what's interesting about this problem is we are talking about something that actually can only un be understood when you start to look at the architecture in real detail. I mean, in the end, it's not the kind of, it's not so much a, uh, the philosophical debate and argument rests on this question of what exactly are the options and have they been explored fully, you know? And so I think that to me is a very different kind of debate in terms of, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's, you know, it's a conversation that um, I think still could go further in terms of looking at different options and what could be saved and what couldn't be. But don't you think you stray into dangerous territory when you kind of rank order the value of a building because it becomes a kind of a personal, uh, a personal decision rather well, than well, a Well, as a critic, I can't say that setting standards is a question of personal decisions. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think we set different values. We judge buildings according to certain criteria. Their function is one of them. Their historical value is another. How to fit into the history of architecture is obviously important. And I think that I'm not saying in, in, in any way that this building does not have importance or value. It ties back to a kind of an arts and crafts tradition um, that I find, um, you know, that it, it, it connects to, it's an, it has a whole attitude that as architects, all of you know about architecture that I think has a very strong position about things. That maybe in that sense also doesn't fit into uh, the mandate of what MoMA wants to do. But maybe that's a good thing, who knows. But I think we all have to set standards when it comes to architecture because, um, you know, as you pointed out, I mean, no one here is, for example, defending the alterations to the Taniguchi building, mm -hmm. right? Fair enough. So fair enough. people are setting standards already in terms of... Fair enough, fair enough. Karen, I'd like to, I'd like to turn to you. Oh, I was going to turn to you anyway with a modified version. Uh, sort of, you can f feel free to jump in on, on where Nikolai was, but also if you would address the question, and this is sort of an extension of this. A few things that Nikolai said that I... Um, Microphone. You have can right, you hear me? Yeah, you got to be right um, on top. Uh, yeah, there are a few things that Nikolai said that I might want to return to later, but I agree with Stephen that um, the word failure is a bit of a distraction in this question. Um, I think it's really a question of priorities and, um, again, the framing of the problem. I mean, that's a fairly straightforward process, how you frame a problem and the values that go into framing that problem. I mean, I was very grateful to have Liz's very thoughtful presentation of their process and their thoughts and their anguished moments. Um, and the presentation of the project unfolds almost like a mathematical theorem. And if you, ex if you accept one piece, then the next piece is sort of logically progresses. But to me, um, one of the basic early assumptions is, is problematic. And once you look at that one basic early assumption, then to me, you have to backtrack over the rest of the argument. And the basic early assumption that I find problematic is this idea of the continuous loop um, of circulation. And the scheme that was accepted by MoMA during the period of time um, between uh, making the deal with, the, with Heinz to have space in the tower and the period of time they were able to acquire the Folk Art Museum, they also accepted a scheme that did not have a circulation, a continuous loop circulation. Now maybe that's not ideal, um, but it was, it was acceptable with what, with what all uh, was available to them. And so the priority was not adjusted with folk art. And to me, that is problematic. And once you make that, that decision, that circulation is more important than anything else, then somehow you seem to lead down the road that, of course, we have to take down the folk art building. But I don't believe with that, primary, that, that earlier assumption. So you have a problem with the early assumption. Do you, do you believe? Do you believe, as a corollary then, we'll start with you and then I'll move on. And the mathematical theorem? Yeah. <laughs> yes, as long as we're talking about mathematical theory, the theora, theorems, um, that uh, I, didn't, I didn't go to Latin class enough. <laughs> um, that MoMA has some kind of specific responsibility to 
uh, Glenn brought this up actually, um, specific responsibility to Folk Art Museum because of its role as a collector and, and uh, protector and, and uh, uh, generator of contemporary architecture. I mean, MoMA has a role, a uh, responsibility to the discipline of architecture um, in the same way it has a responsibility to, the, to art and to photography and to film and to the other departments. I think Anne spoke about that very persuasively. Um, um, so it's the broader question of the responsibility to the discipline, and it has a history of taking a leadership position. And this is a chance to take a position about something you know, it's about walking the walk. You collect architecture, you collect, you, collect, you uh, advocate for architecture, you are faced with an important work of architecture. What do you do with it? Um, to say that there's only one option is not true to the spirit of the Department of Architecture within the museum, which has always consistently looked at a variety of different approaches and histories. And so it's in that way, it's not about one building, um, but it's about a community, um, a community that has come to rely on MoMA for a leadership position and a community that hopes that it would take a building as seriously as it's taken its scholarship about the discipline. Jorge. Yeah. So, I mean, slightly different take. I mean, I think they have a responsibility to the, to the discipline, of course, but that doesn't necessarily mean preserving the folk art museum. Um, I mean, I think it, 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 the responsibility is to raise the question of what is preservation, first of all. And, you know, we've been talking about preservation as if it's, you know, you either don't touch it or you demolish it. And we've seen an exercise of trying to do what we call adaptive reuse. But the question of preservation always raises the, the larger issue of the discipline of architecture. What is architecture and what gives integrity to the work of architecture? And I think that's the question that Liz was trying to grapple with in her presentation, which is at what point do you end up with just a pile of bricks uh, and not a work of architecture. And I think that's the question of quality yet again. And how does, I think the challenge here is to rethink preservation. I mean, what are the, you know, we are talking about a form of preservation that's not legally bound within, within New York City preservation law. We're talking about how does one think about preserving the qualities of that structure that make it architecture. And I think that we have to distinguish those from the materiality of, of the building. It's a building that asks us to think about materiality because it's all about tactile and, and craftiness. But there are other qualities in there that are worth thinking about. I mean, I'm very interested, for example, in how different that building smells from MoMA. I mean, one of the things I really appreciate about the building is its particular uh, olfactory signature. Uh, it doesn't, and that for me is part of the aesthetic integrity of it. Um, whereas MoMA has a distinct sort of uh, airport smell uh, when, you, when you go in. So are there ways in which one could, for example, uh, integrate the olfactory disruptiveness, you know, because uh, Liz was talking about disruption, um, of walking into that more intimate, smaller space and recognize how different it is from, from MoMA. And I think there is um, a, a level of thinking in DSR's plan to create a level of interruption in the, exist in, uh, in the, in the sequence of MoMA that uh, opens the possibility for retaining some of the qualities that make that work architecture, some of the aesthetic qualities, um, that are not necessarily fetishistically material. Um, and so, I, and now again, I don't want to, and, 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 but they're not entirely immaterial. You know, so air is not immaterial. Uh, so I, I, I think that we have to push ourselves to also rethink preservation and not just to uh, continue to think that, you, you know, if you are doing preservation, then you're just, you can't touch the building. And if you're not, then you have a developer mentality that you were just gonna gain square footage. Um, the, the, the fine middle ground is, I think, where brilliance, uh, you know, uh, lies and, and creativity lies. And that's where I think, you know, um, mastery in, 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 in design uh, is, is, uh, is expressed. So I have hope that, that um, 
that we can find that middle ground. And, you know, I think MoMA, if all, of all institutions, is, is the one institution that could see a benefit to that, to being a leader in contemporary, in contemporary design. Uh, and really, uh, as, as uh, curators um, mentioned, um, pushing the envelope about what, what the contemporary is. Okay. Reed, may I just add something to that? Because I think that there's uh, one approach to uh, preservation that's been put on the table only to be dismissed. And it's been dismissed in a very summary fashion. I think it's worth whatever we think about it to actually explore it a little bit. Uh, Nikolai referred a moment ago to facadism, which is a word that Liz also used in one of the press interviews, and that's the notion that you keep the front part of the building that is the public face of the building and essentially do whatever is required to keep it in situ in order to be able to use the space behind it. Um, the fact, it seems to me, that uh, Todd Williams and Billy Chin may have gone on record as saying that they don't like that approach seems to me perfectly irrelevant. Um, this is now an artifact in the city, and the question that I think really needs to be discussed in fora like these is whether the public faces, the uh, public interactive surfaces of buildings don't have to respond to a larger or more difficult set of criteria than the spaces behind them. Uh, if one thinks of any number of European examples, no one is shocked to find Carlo Scarpa's Olivetti showroom behind a 16th century facade in Piazza San Marco, uh, the museum at Verona, the Querini Stampaglia, uh, virtually any piece of architecture by Scarpa starts with the notion that the artifacts which are found on site are fair game both as material and ideas to be redefined in a comprehensive way that is not passeist or trying in some sense to create uh, a melange of things, but is in fact entering into a dialogue. If you look at all of the recent institutional transformations in Paris, as you all know, there's uh, a slaughterhouse, a ministry of finance, a railroad station, and a hotel de ville, all of which have been successfully transformed into museums. The reason that those spaces exist in some continuity with their historical context is because that was part of the definition of the problem. Now, I'm again not saying that MoMA has any obligation to preserve that facade, but I think simply dismissing that approach by labeling it facadism and saying we don't like that is to duck a very, very serious preservation issue. Well, I, Kate, what, 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 what? Actually, at all. I, was, I, was really sure about that. I said you can make an argument for it. Okay, I, I want. Uh, but that's what we're talking about. Yeah. I'm going to cut this off because I want to go to at least one other different kind of question while we still have time, because we're going to run out of time for this section in a minute. I'm going to direct it towards Catherine. We've talked about the building and we've talked about the architects and we've talked about MoMA. Um, so, uh, sorry, talked about the building, talked about MoMA. I'd like to talk about architects and architecture for a moment and their responsibilities, or actually, I'd like you to do that instead. And I, I'd like you to address the question about how does an architecture firm how does an architect balance the responsibility they have to the client with what might be a conflicting sense of responsibility to the city or to the general public? Where does the architect's responsibility to the client end, take a, take a stab at this, and their responsibility to that other audience begin? Well, I told you when I saw the question, I didn't like it, and I wanted a different question. We actually all wanted to swap our, the questions that Reed gave us. <laughs> Um, but, but the fact of the matter is I think that Liz set that forward in a very clear way. Um, I think, you know, I came here on the subway tonight and I got out at 65th Street and Broadway in front of Lincoln Center and I just always marvel at what DSNR did there. I just think it's fantastic. We know that they really, um, as she said, have our strong advocates of adaptive reuse. And I think as Liz explained it, and in fact it was a little different than the pr presentation that I heard in their office a couple of weeks ago, um, the repurposing of that space was something that their client uh, obviously had veto power over, and there was a little more detail about that in the presentation tonight, that, that, that what that was gonna be used for, um, 
was not satisfying to certain, <coughs> to the curatorial department or the educational department, and obviously what it would be repurposed for, you know, matters to the client and DSNR um, ultimately came to a conclusion that had to do with input from their client. That happens all the time. Uh, this is unusual because their client isn't a, you know, private commercial developer. It's the Museum of Modern Art. We, as we're all saying, feel invested in that, even though they have every right to tear the building down if they want. We feel profoundly invested in that. And that makes it open to a larger question. And I have to say that it's a very fastidious thing, a process that Liz showed to us in a relatively brief time, but clearly there is more than one way to um, adapt this building. And I don't think it, I can see that it can't be preserved as is. I don't, I don't think most of us up here are advocating of that but I think there are more than one approaches to connecting the museum to the Heinz Tower galleries, and I think that there are more than one way to repurpose the building, but perhaps not within the parameters set forth by the client. Hey, Clay, you want to take a shot at that? Well, I, I, I don't think the client really is that this is the forum to discuss the client in a way. I think, I think everyone here is here because they agree that MoMA has a public responsibility, dual responsibilities. One is to their collection, right? And one is to architecture, as Karen pointed out, right? And I think the question is how you balance those two issues. And I think we've been very vague about talking about this in some sense because we're not actually addressing the plan, you know, in any specific way. I mean, I think if you go back, I would pull back all the way to the beginning. I think MoMA tried to do certain things with the Taniguchi edition. And it's clear that there are major issues with that building now, a lot of people feel. I think one of the first questions is, who's the audience for the collection? And I think that's changed a lot since, since the whole process began with Taniguchi in the mid-90s, right? I think once you look at the, um, <clears throat> the audience, you have to also talk about, which I was shocked wasn't brought up today, the reorganization of MoMA's collections, which is a big part of what's driving this, right? And I'm sure that... Glenn can talk about this, and Anne can talk about this in a moment if they feel like it. But to me, part of the discussion here is, if you're really going to reorganize a collection without departments, you're going to integrate things like architecture, right, art, uh, you know, painting, film, um, photography, you have to start rethinking the whole complex, right, the whole campus and how it functions. Those are very big issues for the public. Forget about the client, right? in terms of how that museum is experienced, you know, who's going to see it. Some of these issues can be addressed very simply. Open the museum till midnight, you know, um, when you're talking about being able to see the collection in a kind of more quiet surroundings. But some of these are really serious architectural issues. When you start looking at that, there's certain things I think in, in <coughs> Dillard Scafidio and Renfro's plan that I think are very interesting. One that I haven't seen discussed anywhere is this idea of multiple points of entry into the museum, right? So you'll now be able to enter not just on the main 53rd, 54th Street lobby, but you'll be able to enter at the East End through the Lauder lobby, through the old Goodwin Stone building. When you start looking at the museum at that end, and then you have this access that I don't know, I mean, I wish we could put the image back up there. This kind of east-west access that starts to link the different parts of the campus. When you start looking at this as an architectural problem, one of my questions to Liz would have been, Okay, if you're trying to create multiple entries, maybe then the Folk Art Museum should be an entry point rather than an art box. Maybe the art box should go to PS1, which is a different kind of way of experiencing art, right? And this becomes an entrance which, in fact, actually lines up with one of the main um, elevator cores and circulation cores in the building now in the new addition. So when you start looking at that, you start thinking differently about the issues of preservation, because you're looking at a different plan suddenly. I think then as you move up the building, I think the issue of the floor slabs is an enormous problem. I would actually, I actually think in that case, there was, a, I suspect, some kind of sense in when they were working on this scheme that the ghost of the building had to somehow be preserved, right? And so these spaces had to somehow, any spaces on this site had to be somehow unique or feel different. As you said, there are very different ways of thinking about that. 
I think you could also make the argument that that's where the preservation argument starts to fall apart, because the difference in floor heights are not four inches. They are on one floor, but on the others, they're close to five feet. So that involves ramps. So how do you deal with the ramps? Maybe instead of having these boxes, you want a much more fluid circulation. You want to level out the floors and erase the differences. Right? So then you start getting into percentages, which I think is, in terms of the presentation, really what we're all talking about. You know? Maybe there's a way to preserve the ground floor of the building and the facade if you rethink the proposal, right? And yet, as you go up, you can't preserve the rest. Maybe the whole thing has to come down. But I think that what you really have to look at is the most boring part of the discussion, <laughs> which is architecture, which is the hardest thing to talk about. It's much sexier to pull back and talk about big issues about preservation, which, you know, it, it's, it's an important topic. But on the other hand, I think in the end, it's the boring questions that allow you to really come to concrete conclusions about what parts of this building can and can't be preserved. And until those questions have been really clearly answered, I think it's very difficult to come to real conclusions about this thing. And I, I, just to add, I would have, again, gone back to the beginning in this conversation and started with a question about what MoMA's priorities are in terms of the future. Yeah, and I, and I, 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 just, to, I just want to say that I was a little stunned when you said you wanted to go back to the beginning and the beginning was Taniguchi. I mean, Taniguchi is 10 years ago, it's not the 1880s, and so I just think it's important to have a, this scale of time that we're talking about as well in all of this, and what are the changes, and what can be predicted, and what can't be predicted. Well, by Taniguchi, I obviously meant the, build, the, the campus up to that point. I wasn't just talking about Taniguchi, right? So okay, let's, all of the let's, versions of it. we need to, draw this, unfortunately, we have to draw this to a conclusion, this section, because we've got another group of five or 600 people that I know have turned in lots of cards. So what I'd like to do now is ask each of you, and maybe starting with Stephen, um, to just give us a concluding comment or two. And I really do want you to keep your time to just a minute or so um, uh, in order so we can move on to the next section. So Stephen? Uh, I think one of the most regrettable things about the way in which this whole set of issues has come to the fore is that Talk, it's, Talking to your mic directly. Sorry, I was just saying I think that one of the most regrettable uh, aspects of the way in which this entire issue has been discussed is the kind of treatment that it's had in the press and a discussion which I can only say has been an all or nothing, a kind of Manichaean debate. Uh, and I think that if this forum serves a purpose, it's precisely what was suggested in some of the last comments, that there are any number of ways to think about meaningful preservations of elements and fragments of urban history. And that as long as we insist on a kind of winner-take-all or all-or-nothing solution, we're not beginning to talk seriously about the obligations of institutions and the expectations of the public that support them. Thank you. Karen? Um, I guess I would say that um, there's been a lot of thoughtful discussion here and in the press, um, some of it less thoughtful than others, um, and we've heard a lot of different opinions. And for me, within all of that, there's some essential facts. And um, I keep kind of going back to those facts because some of the facts don't add up, and that always makes me uneasy as a fan of facts. Um, so um, when the, some of the basic issues contradict each other. So for me, it's fact number one, MoMA owns the Folk Art Museum, and it pains me to say this, but they can do whatever they want with it. And if uh, I were a betting person, I would bet that they're going to tear it down in, in its entirety, and it's their right to do so. Um, they don't need our permission. Um, there is not an entity in the city that's powerful enough or interested enough to intervene, as far as I can tell. So that's the first fact. The second fact um, is that MoMA started a Department of Architecture in 1932, and that from what I understand was based on um, Alfred Barr's initial vision of a multidisciplinary museum. And um, that Department of Architecture has been um, a strong advocate and steward of architecture um, in, for all those many years. And so to me, the mission of that department, the fact of that department, and the fact that MoMA will probably tear down this building are col collide in some way. Because there is, for me, um, a disconnect between a, a cultural mission 
and a kind of institutional real estate uh, plan. Um, I would expect, I guess, uh, Walmart to tear down the building if they owned it, but I expect something better from MoMA. Um, so I realize when, we, when I say tearing down, I mean, we're speaking, we're losing some of the subtlety of all of the discussion of what it means to tear down, keep, not keep, but um, since I have to be brief, I'm speaking in generalizations. I mean, it's worth, and this is parenthetical, if, if for example, the folk art site contained a site-specific work of art by Richard Serra, what would the museum do in that case? Would it find itself advocating to tear down um, a Richard Serra? Um, so that would be a very tricky position to, to, uh, for the museum to be in, because I think that they consider art sort of the main course and maybe architecture is a side dish or something. So, you know, that's a harder, it's a harder thing to argue for. So anyway, um, and then the third fact that I find distressing or distracting is this idea that uh, the circulation cannot be solved unless you tear down um, MoMA, because it had been solved before. It wasn't a great solution, but it was a solution and it was one acceptable to MoMA. So as I said, um, I, the facts don't entirely add up to me, and that makes me uncomfortable. And then the last thing that I would say is that I find it uncomfortable that the word bespoke has become a bad word. Um, I would like to believe, and I say this uh, in relation to the architecture that's probably going to be torn down, and also in terms of the architecture that I hope for in the future, that I always thought great architecture was made to measure. So it, uh, I'll be short. Um, well, in, in conclusion, <laughs> I guess we have a little bit more. Of a I'd say that, oh, sorry. Um, I, I say, you know, I think what's for me, um, uh, you know, the sum of our, our discussion is that, you know, this is clearly, and, and Liz said it, this is, a, this, is a, this is a building that stakes out a very strong position. Um, and it is at odds with um, the, the, the desires of, the, of, of, of MoMA's uh, um, board. Um, it, it, for me, it's unquestionable that it is a significant building, uh, whether you, um, whether you ag agree with what it stands for or disagree with what it stands for. Because, uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot of architects out there for whom this building uh, is irritating. Uh, and there are a lot of architects for whom this building is, is uh, enticing. And I think, so, the, so it's not about whether we like it or not. So I want to sort of r remove that from the table. It's about this, this building significant and staking out those positions and helping us as a discipline articulate our positions. It, it helps us understand what architecture is today. And in that sense, it's terribly significant and has important qualities worth preserving and conceiving and pushing us to, to think about how to preserve it in a different way. So it asks us to preserve, not to museify. This is not a collection piece. Museum is not, uh, you know, the, 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 the idea of preservation is not to, to treat it as an untouchable object. So, so it is our responsibility to, to try to think through how the museum can benefit from, from preserving the qualities that make this building. And I would just ask the audience and the board to, to imagine themselves 15 years from now, 20 years from now, when the announcement is made that MoMA is finally going to move to, uh, to uh, another location, you know, that there will be different players, there will be a different board, uh, there, and they will decide that there's not enough room midtown, finally there's just no room to expand, and there'll be another place to go. Um, we, preservation asks us to think deep into the future, what will we be left with? Um, and I think that's, that's ultimately what I think the, the, the board should be thinking about. What will they be leaving the city as a work of architecture um, when they, uh, as MoMA, move on? Here, and then we'll finish. You on the well, I'll, try to, I'll try to be brief, but I guess, I guess I think there's a cloud hanging over this because I've already had kind of, you know, had plenty of time to make my argument about the the building and the, and the campus in general. But I think there's a cloud hanging over this whole discussion 
which just popped in my head when Karen was speaking, about the whole issue of um, the public process. And I think one of the things that I think has made this such a charged conversation is because, and I think, I think also of the New York Public Library, a similar kind of issue, is the way information comes out, when the public is invited to take part in the conversation, when it's not, and a sense generally in New York City that the public has been kind of pushed out of decisions about its city's future, cultural future, architectural future, and things like that. And I do think that um, in a perfect world, what I would love to see is these bigger discussions discussed up front in a public forum, you know? And then from there, the public invited to participate at different stages along the way. And I think one of the things that happens with all of these projects and has to do with development considerations, political considerations, is the public is invited into the process very late and therefore feels helpless, voiceless, you know? And I think that's something that's a kind of a, a, a bigger issue that has to be addressed in the city. And I don't know if we would end up with coming to a different conclusion. It's a separate question. But I think it's something that on some level, there has to be more pressure to kind of change the system in terms of how these decisions are made. Thank you. I agree. Kathleen, finally. Well, I will only take um, a very brief time to say that uh, I think all my colleagues on the panel have been very eloquent. Uh, look at this as an incredibly difficult, uh, painful, clearly not simple, we can see that. But I do think um, two things. First of all, I think we look to our cultural and academic institutions as um, stewards of history and values and shifting cultural values, and I think there are so many question marks over this fairly new building that's clearly significant, that clearly elicits strong emotions. And just like many works in the collection of MoMA, which were disparaged when they were first made and now are greatly uh, you know, appreciated and now mass considered masterpieces, or even works in the collection that were purchased at a time when they were very excited to acquire them and now you know, years later they go kind of, eh? You know, we have so many questions about this building, and to Jorge's point, what are we going to think in 10, 15, 25 years when it is gone? I'm concerned about the speed with which this has happened. I think originally um, MoMA was moving slowly. They originally said there might be exhibitions when they bought the Folk Art Museum. Um, they, there was a time when they thought the Heinz galleries would be delivered to them as a shell and they weren't going to move very quickly. I was surprised when I asked Glenn Lowry how soon it might be torn down and he said by June. Uh, I think everything that's being said and discussed here, here and in, the, in a wider forum is reason to really stop and reconsider uh, that idea and to Nikolai's point, uh, have a wider, uh, broader discussion. Are there two chairs there? I, uh, all right, so what I'd like to do now is ask Ann Temkin and Glenn Lowry to come join us at this end of the table. And Liz Diller, would you please take my seat? <laughs> um, all right, we've got a series of questions here, and I think not surprisingly, most of them are aimed at the other end of this table. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure why you're letting the panel get off quite this easily. I thought they said a bunch of radical, crazy things you could have picked on, but no, no, no. We're going to, I think, hear a little bit more from MoMA and possibly from Liz. I'm going to start off with a kind of plaintive general one. Um, and this comes from Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to. Maybe she should stand. <laughs> and Daisy worries that she's butchering part of a quote from Le Corbusier that says something to the effect of life is always right, and when it seems unfair, try harder. Clearly, this room recognizes injustice and is asking for those in authority to try harder and asks, is trying again and trying harder to save the Folk Art Museum still an option? So I think 
that we've tried very hard. Uh, this is not for lack of effort. Uh, um, Richard, uh, sorry, sorry, Richard. Glenn, can you get right up close to this? Is that better? <laughs> yes, it is. That's better. That better? Sorry. Uh, so to answer Daisy's question, uh, we've tried very hard. It's not that we arrived at this conclusion easily or quickly. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about it. We worked through a lot of options. It wasn't just one option uh, with Diller Scafidio and Renfro. And we've made our decision. Um, I do think there are some things that can be adjusted because I paid a lot of attention to Jorge Otero's observation about the olfactory impact of buildings. And those of you who saw the last slide that Ann Temkin showed, which was uh, Mike Kelly's deodorizer, which emits perfume, uh, I have a feeling that that will have a beneficial impact when it's installed. Um, all right, so here's a second question. And this comes from Louise Hartman, an architect. And uh, there's several questions here, and I'm going to just choose part of it. Um, these have to do with why about creating the best art viewing experience. And if MoMA really needs to expand, why not expand MoMA PS1 or MoMA to another location, not simply MoMA in its current location? <laughs> I'd like that, Liz, is that something that you would, no, no send that to Glenn. Okay, Glenn. <laughs> I'm really glad you're down there. <laughs> no, I, of course, look, I'm happy to answer that. Now, I'd ask Ann Temkin to join me as well, uh, because it's, of course, a question that we think about all the time. Uh, you, you can't imagine the number of conversations that occur at the museum on a regular basis about the degree to which it makes sense to try and keep the collection whole uh, within a single site, or the degree to which it makes sense to look at multiple sites. And we struggle with that, not just in the present, but we've struggled with that over decades. And I think the unique quality of the Museum of Modern Art, beyond the very quality of its collection, is the fact that it can show in absolute proximity the art of the immediate past, Picasso and Leger, Mondrian and Matisse, to just take a few examples, with the art of today, with what's happening right now. And it's the tension that that generates and the ability to lay out a history or histories that are whole that make it, I think, such a remarkable place. So if you start to imagine how you would divide it up, would you put, let's say, architecture and photography in Long Island City? Create a lot more space. But now you've divorced architecture and photography from the fabric of the rest of the collection. And if you start to say, let's slice a line down, pick a decade, uh, 1950, now suddenly on what side does Picasso fall because his career continues a lot further. And the more you explore that, the more you think about it, the less satisfactory it is uh, as a strategy. And while MoMA PS1 is an extraordinarily important part of the Museum of Modern Art, it is extraordinary precisely because it's an unprogrammed space, that it's not about showing the collection. It's about being able to do a series of experiments with emerging artists in particular. And it, you could never have an exhibition like Mike Kelly that's on right now, I don't think, in another museum in this city, because there just isn't the space. Uh, so I think one has to look at that idea of bifurcation or multiplication uh, and then ask, how would it actually work and would it actually produce a better result? And I don't know, Anne, if you want to join in on that? And you got to be right next to the mic. <laughs> okay. Um, just one more point on the Mike Kelly show at MoMA PS1. I think it's important to point out, too, the issue of time as well as space, because that's an exhibition that was offered to circulate in the U.S. at a point at which MoMA had already had a full calendar for at least two or three years. And the beauty of a place like MoMA PS1 is a year or less in advance, they can say, yeah, why don't we just empty out our building a few months from now to host this thing that we at MoMA and MoMA PS1 think is really important. 
But other than that point specifically, I do um, agree with Glenn that the direction that we're moving in curatorially and intellectually that isn't reflected in our spaces right now is one that, if anything, is far more integrative rather than divided. And so at this moment, more than any, the unity of the place feels um, primary. One thing that, one thing that I, I would just say to, to just tie um, a thread from a previous comment, I don't know whether it was, I think it was Nikolai, um, that suggested maybe the Folk Art Museum could be used as an entrance for something, for, you mentioned that, mm -hmm. for a new wing. Um, and, and I learned a lot in this process, a lot of, around how MoMA thinks and, and its uh, curatorial objectives. Um, it, we had a scheme, actually, um, that did exactly that, that um, uh, where the folk art was, in, was a circulation zone to Lahines as a stack of temporary galleries. So we would remove temporary galleries from the rest of the museum and say collections were on one side, uh, temporary uh, exhibitions on the other. And that was seen by MoMA, and I think now I understand very well why, as a bifurcation of their audience, which would be that, you know, tourists might go this way and New Yorkers would go this way. And the desire to really mix up the populations that go to MoMA and to actually tie um, things together across histories is really became a very, very compelling point in um, really stretching those horizontal plates to be able to expand and then com compose. I think I just heard the audience agree that the idea of separating tourists and native New Yorkers is a good idea. It's a good idea. <laughs> Xenophobic monsters. <laughs> Control yourselves. <laughs> Um, Liz, I think this one is for you. Um, this comes from Heidi Blau, and, and it goes right to what you were just saying. That uh, Heidi asks about, it says that much of the conversation has been built around the, the issue of uh, organizing the museum along horizontal planes. And she asks whether or not there was a consideration for looking at it more from a vertical organization instead that might have relieved some of the, the difficulty that's present here. It's, you know, in every uh, museum um, commission or discussion that I've had, um, museum directors always want horizontality, simply be, to be able to tell a story in some way that, that is um, easy to navigate. Um, in this case, the, the um, MoMA is displaying its collections um, in, a, in a chronology. And this is something that's important to them. And within those chronological stories, there are other stories and sub-stories. Um, it, it, you know, we could not find, so aside from the institutional desire and mandate to expand, you know, those periods, those blocks of time to fill in more work that is left out of those stories. Um, but, but, you know, in addition to that, it's very, very, um, to, I can't imagine how you would um, really do service to the collection and to the curating of any shows by making vertical circulation. Um, if, if folk art was entirely independent and if there was no need um, for um, making that link, um, I suppose one could imagine a vertical strategy just for that building, but not for the rest of MoMA. That doesn't make sense. And, you know, it's just, I hate to be the person that's the logical person here, you know? I mean, it's just like, you know, I mean, like the service architects that bring you the logical solution about optimization of space and all of that. But it's truly um, impossible. For, for us, we would have not been able to follow through with a commission um, if there had not been an opportunity to make good galleries. You know, and that's just a fact that there is the, the, the hindsight by itself would produce really an impossible gallery situation. Why would we do that? Why would, you know, why would we, that right now we're criticizing MoMA for having circulation problems. Why, uh, you know, 
uh, make it such that this, the expansion makes no sense at all. So, you know, it's just, it's, sen it's common sense in a way. Um, I'm gonna address this to Jorge. Um, you thought you were done, but you're not. <laughs> I'm grateful. <laughs> oh, you'll get yours, I'm holding the best I'm one. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, Leila La Gizik, and I apologize if, uh, if I mispronounced the last name, um, wants to know whether, should, uh, whether city laws should be uh, amended in some fashion to consider giving landmark status to contemporary architecture. Um, well, I mean, you know, there are countries where the, there is no sort of moving wall for, for preservation. Um, Brazil, for example, landmark Nehemiah buildings before they were finished, you know, uh, <laughs> that's Nehemiah. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know that they deserved landmark, some of the late works, but um, um, uh, should, should we revise landmark designation? Yes, but probably this is not the reason, you know, this is, um, if, uh, one of the main things, for example, of landmarks is it's very difficult to designate an interior. It would be practically impossible to designate this interior because it wasn't technically public. You had to pay a ticket to get in. So you, wouldn't, you would only really be able to, to designate the facade. But that's what the New York City Landmarks designates. That's the public interest is the public street, what can be experience from the public street. So it would, um, if we were to change the moving wall, we would be talking about preserving that facade, which uh, uh, I suppose could still be done uh, and, and solve all the circulation issues and so on. Um, but, you know, I, I think the landmarks preservation law always needs to be rethought. It has uh, a lot of problems with it. Uh, so I would say yes, but this is not the, the, the major problem of the landmarks preservation law. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna do two more questions. Um, I'm not really sure who to aim this one at, um, but Liz, maybe you'll pick this one up. Idiosyncrasy, inefficiency, and expense were the reasons cited by the developers who wanted to demolish the High Line, <laughs> and they were wrong. Does a cultural institution have a special rationale or perhaps maybe a special obligation, that's my own words, for valuing idiosyncrasy, inefficiency, and investment in a manner that, our, that the private sector may not? Vishan Chakrabarty. <laughs> and the book is on sale. And <laughs> um, I... I I have to say, of course, um, idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy is important and, and inefficient. We, we stand for all of that. Um, at the same time, you know, we have a co kind of complicated role in this. Um, and, uh, you know, if, the, if, the, if no one touched this, this building, if MoMA um, wasn't about to expand and the building were there, um, you know, uh, I mean, it would be great if, if it were open so people could see it, you know? I mean, for the problem, we're talking about this thing almost um, past, future, very strange. Um, so, so the building, while it was um, open, was, I think many of us saw those kind of idiosyncrasies, and it was really, you know, it, it, the bespoke nature of things, Karen, um, I, I don't think that's a bad word. Those are, those are all good things. It, it all becomes a question when you are trying to do something next, when you really need to do something next and not um, be kind of paralyzed by something that pre-existed. And this is a really difficult you know, problem for us eth ethically. It's a problem uh, uh, professionally. Um, but we believe that, that in this set of circumstances, um, there's, there's an ambition that MoMA has that uh, we think is really important to the public. And when we think of ourselves in the future, you know, and I mean, I'm, there's something very kind of out of body here going on that there are a group of architects that are not here today. Um, and there are all these people that are talking about their work. And, um, and when I think about our own work in the future, I wish that, that 
there could be a public forum about our work and people would remember and advocate for the work. Um, but, you know, uh, we can't think of ourselves historically that way. It's very, very difficult from the position of the present to, um, to make monuments, to feel like the moment you've made something on earth, even Lincoln Center, that, that we've um, helped and we think that it's being very well appreciated, we have no idea. Architects have no control over the future. You know, that's the, one of the terrifying things about all of this, is that the moment an architect steps away, it has no control. They have no control. And futures change all the time. Clients change. In this particular case, the client abandoned the building. It, it's sitting fallow. We believe that, that MoMA has um, a wonderful opportunity here in this expansion. And if, if Folk Art Museum were left out, it would be easy. It would just be so easy to advocate without any gray area. Um, that it's doing a really, really good thing forward. Um, it's doing something, as critics of MoMA, it's, it actually is doing a good thing f uh, forward that we would like to stand behind. And, and, um, and, and we're proud to be a part of this. And it's, you know, it's a damn shame in a way that, that you know, it's, it's um, that the building is so obdurate, you know? That's all I could say. I mean, at, as a, at a point, I just wrestled with my anger for the building itself, because if the building were less particular, it would be so much easier to be able to operate inside of it and to make the surgeries and the necessary changes. But the building um, very, very much resists it. So I, I think idiosyncrasy is great. In this case, in this very particular case, you know, it's, it's irreconcilable with the future for MoMA. I want to thank a bunch of people whose questions we're not going to get to tonight. Um, many names I haven't seen, but I have at least four here. John Hyman, Nikita, Nikita Pinson, I can't, Pe Pezinoff, Richard Gluckman, and interestingly, Matthew Baird, project architect for the Folk Art Museum. Um, but I am, no, nope, I'm not. I'm going to ask a question from Andrea Manfred instead, which I think a lot of architects in the room have been thinking tonight, and this is for you, Glenn, um, and it's a tough one. And uh, I think it underlies a lot of the questions that were asked tonight. Um, and it, it touches on an on an editorial that uh, my friend Ned Kramer wrote as well that posed the question slightly differently. But Andrea Manfred wants to know, why do you treat architecture differently than a work of art in MoMA's collection? Is architecture not considered an art? And don't you, pref don't you feel you're betraying your mission for safeguarding art in tearing down folk art? So Thank you, Reed, and it's an excellent question, uh, and one that obviously we think about a great deal. And architecture is different from painting and sculpture. I don't think there's an architect who would dispute the fact that architecture comes about in a very different way and serves a very different purpose. So we treat architecture with the same seriousness as we would treat any other discipline we collect but we don't collect buildings and we don't collect them for a reason. Uh, and I'm still, I suppose, um, old-fashioned enough to believe that architecture is tied to function and has to serve a purpose. It doesn't exist as an autonomous object. If it existed as an autonomous object, then the Folk Art Museum would never have come into being because it replaced very beautiful brownstones that were demolished to make way for that building. And if that were the case, then what would be the condition under which any building could ever be demolished or torn down? So I think architecture raises a completely different set of questions and engenders a different set of responsibilities. And I heard Karen clearly. 
and I know how you feel, and I know how many others feel here, because we all have emotional responses to uh, things that move us, of course, uh, and architecture has that ability. But I thought that the way uh, Jorge Otero started to frame the complexity of what's involved in preservation or, and I would flip that around, in use. Because I think the argument he was making wasn't that preservation exists in isolation. That preservation, however you define it, is actually tied to function. The ability to give life to a building uh, after its original owner or owners are no longer able to use it. So I, I see this as a very complicated issue and I don't think um, you can simply say that architecture exists with the same autonomy and independence, divorced from function, uh, that uh, uh, a painting or a sculpture does. They're not the same thing, even if we can value them similarly at a cultural level. And I think we're going to leave it on that note. I think we've had extraordinary input from Karen and Stephen and Nikolai and Jorge and Kathleen, and I'd like to ask you to help me thank them before we disappear. We need to thank again our good friends from the Architectural League, from the Municipal Art Society, and AIA New York chapter. We need to thank the folks from MoMA, Anne, and Glenn for being here. This was not easy for them to do tonight. Peter Reed clearly needs to know that they need a different cleaning and freshening air scent for the museum moving forward so you can pass that down. Um, I want to stay, but I want to end by saying a particular and a special thanks to the person who I think might have had the most on the line here tonight, and that's Liz Diller representing her whole firm. We thank you all, and we thank all of you for coming out on a cold night. Have a great evening, and don't give up the fight.